one minute past and uh, amazing uh, we've uh, passed the 100 participants already we have 140 in the room so let's get started uh before starting i just want to uh present a couple minutes of background about this uh, zoominar series so uh, this all started last year as we were preparing for an international innovation forum on agri-food systems uh, was supposed to happen mid-March last year, exactly when the COVID started hitting the region and everywhere. And we turned it out in, into a series of webinars on Zoom we called Zoominars. So it has reached thousands of participants from all across the board. So this is a very uh, broad partnership or community of practice with the government institutions, the private sector, youth, you name it. And we started uh, this uh, series on various topics related all to agri-food systems innovation. Actually, we turned the most part of the uh, uh, forum program into the series of seminars. And we did that, as you can see in the bottom, a very broad partnership uh, with uh, IFAD, ICARDA, ICBA, uh, Saudi institutions, World Bank and ITU, and uh, of course, many others. Uh, now, uh, this year, we're following up on this uh, series, as you can see there, uh, 2021. Uh, this is the third one today's innovation agronomy. We had already one on agribusiness and Kubernetes with uh, the African Union, and we had another one on uh, food waste. And you can see there all the topics. Uh, in the coming events. So I'm showing this to invite you all to uh, uh, stay tuned. And uh, in general, it's once a month. And in, uh, we try to do it on a Thursday. That's what we did last year. This, uh, this particular one in agronomy wasn't possible on Thursday. So it's on Monday, but in general, it's the first Thursday every month. So we welcome you all. Uh, today's uh, event, as you can see, uh, is on agronomy and uh, regenerative agriculture, agroecology and climate smart. And we are uh, privileged to have uh, eminent uh, speakers, uh, uh, panelists, and uh, we also have the privilege of having uh, Dr. Ismahan El Wafi, the chief scientist of FAO, who will be uh, giving the opening remarks. Uh, this event will be co-moderated by Jean-Marc Forest, who is the regional program leader, and uh, with Teresa Wong, who is she's the climate uh, change officer here at Erini. So without further ado, I turn the floor to uh, Teresa and Jean-Marc for uh, uh, presenting the speakers and uh, moving forward. Uh, Jean-Marc and Teresa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rashid, and welcome to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, my name is Teresa Wong, and I will be joined uh, in a little bit by Jean-Marc Foray. Um, first, um, before we get into the logistics of this, um, of this session, I would like to first uh, invite Ms. Ismahan Al-Wafi, Chief Scientist, to give our open, uh, the opening remarks for this event. Um, Ms. Ismahan Al-Wafi is a Chief Scientist at the Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, she is our first Chief Scientist, and this is a position that is aimed at strengthening the role of science, technology, and innovation in FAO's work. Prior to joining FAO, uh, Ms. Al-Wafi was Director General at the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, based in UAE, focusing on developing solutions for marginal environments. She has also held uh, previous scientific, uh, senior scientific and leadership positions in Canada and in Morocco. So without much further ado, I would like to invite um, Dr. Ismahan to give her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Teresa. Do you hear me okay? Yes, we do, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. And um, apologies, colleagues. I can't turn my camera on. I'm in an area with low bandwidth. So uh, really a pleasure to be with you today, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first welcome you all to this important regional dialogue on agroecology, regenerative agriculture and climate smart agriculture. Let me also warmly thank my FAO colleague from the regional office for the Near East and North Africa, who through their innovation Zoominar offer a wonderful platform through which we can discuss issues of importance to the region and beyond. At FAO, we believe that meetings like this one 
help to strengthen the science and innovation component of our programs and decisions. They enable the sharing of ideas to reach a common understanding, which ultimately increases the impact of our efforts on the globe and on the ground. By now, we all know that sustainability and resilience of agri-food system hang in a balance and are increasingly a matter of survival. And believe me, I could see that as we are preparing for the UN Food System Summit, that to really sustainability and resilience came out as the very important component that we have to, to keep in mind. The COVID-19 crisis has clearly demonstrated how vulnerable our current agri-food system are to disruptions. Climate change is expected to widen the existing vulnerabilities in the agricultural production systems. And this is especially critical for countries in the region where we have already we are facing several natural resources limitation, namely water, but many others as well. So there is an urgent need for a radical shift in the way agri-food system are governed. The challenge is to sustainably increase food production while conserving the natural resource base and ensuring that agriculture forms part of the solution for mitigating and adapting to climate change. Agroecology and regenerative agriculture are sustainable agricultural approaches that have been developed over several decades in an attempt to reconcile agriculture with natural processes for the mutual benefit of our ecosystem and our livelihood. And basically agroecology and regenerative agriculture started what we would want to call really a mutual benefit or mutualism. So the concept of climate smart agriculture, CSA, was first coined by FAO in 2009. So that's already 12 years ago to describe an approach where agriculture could capture synergies in mitigation and adaptation to climate change while enhancing agricultural productivity and enhancing income. Today, we are privileged to have with us some of the scientists and practitioners who have been closely involved in these approaches. And I welcome them all. And I'm really happy to see that the debate is going to be done by scientists and practitioners that know the subject very well. While time has passed since these concepts were first developed, the demand has remained high to better understand these approaches, how these approaches can be applied to different contexts, and what their potential impact may be. We do need more data. We do need more evidence, particularly in different ecosystems. Agroecology can be a promising approach for achieving multiple benefits for the environment and farming communities in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate mitigation and adaptation, and in terms of human and planetary health and livelihood. However, the evidence is fragmented. In fact, FAO has developed a tool for agroecology agro performance evaluation to assess the multidimensional performance of agroecology and is currently being tested in 29 countries globally. And that will provide us the data that we are missing that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. Regenerative agriculture is quickly becoming more mainstream and receiving significant attention, but there is no widely accepted definition yet. There is still much to be done to build up the evidence base for sound decision-making, especially in the NENA region. So it is important to recognize that there are areas of convergence and divergence among these approaches. It is also important to remember that without changes in consumption, along with a sharp reduction in food waste and post-harvest losses, agricultural production must grow to meet future food demand of a growing population. So we have to remember that we need to produce more unless really our consumption pattern change dramatically and we cut our food waste and loss. So dialogues around these approaches are therefore very important to ensure that debates are not limited among merely scholars and academics, but that we also include and engage practitioners 
in development, policymakers, and last but not, not least, the small scale producers. So one thing is clear, we have the opportunity to better embrace the complexity and system, system thinking that are inherent in these approaches. Invest more in integrated multidisciplinary research and widen the net so that everyone has access to knowledge. Opportunities like today's Zoominar, which allow for a deeper dialogue and exchange of knowledge and experience across regions, countries, and communities are key. They help to bring more clarity to the needed transformation of the food system, of the food system that we are really discussing along in 2020, we have been discussing it, but continuing in 2021, uh, leading us to the UN Food System Summit. Uh, and make them, what we need to in this transformation is to make our agri-food system more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. Our exchange of today also contribute to policy coherence and action towards better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life to, for achieving the SDGs, SDGs and leaving no one behind. And I think really with the approval of the strategic framework last week by the council, we're really gathering our thinking around the really better production, better nutrition, better environment for a better life to make sure that we achieve SDGs and to make sure above all that we leave no one behind. I'm very much looking forward to this afternoon discussion and thank you very much to the colleague in RNA for the invitation and for organizing this interesting seminar. Over to you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Andoafi, for those uh, inspiring remarks. Um, as, as you rightly pointed out, I think we, there has been a lot of work done um, over the last decade, um, not just by FAO, but many organizations. And this is a really good time to take stock of where we're at with these three concepts. Um, and uh, adjoining concepts and also noting the urgency and the demands that continue uh, from our member countries on, on support for, for this, uh, for agriculture that also takes into account sustainability. Um, so thank you very much and welcome to everyone who has just joined us to our innovations in economy, agro, agro, uh, agronomy, a regional dialogue on regenerative agriculture, agroecology and climate smart agriculture. Um, just to, to, to note, um, and should have said this before, perhaps that um, there is an interpretation function at the bottom of the screen, of the Zoom screen, where you are able to listen to the, the uh, live interpretation also in French and Arabic. Um, so in, in, um, in terms of format, we will have two parts. In the first part of this webinar, we will have two speakers. Um, and the second part will be a moderated panel discussion with uh, three other guests. So as our time is uh, limited today, um, and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting and lively discussion, uh, for the last uh, Q&A in the last 30 minutes, we will be using the chat box to collect questions from all of you. Um, we will be giving preference to questions that relate to the Near East and North Africa because we want the opportunity to make sure that um, what we've heard today also uh, lends itself to practical applications on the ground. And we invite um, our, our friends and colleagues from the region, uh, from the countries in the region, the Near East and North Africa to ask these questions. But we also very welcome, uh, we also welcome all of you to write down any questions you might have for any of our speakers. And we also invite the speakers to answer these questions in the chat and also to post relevant resources. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our first two speakers. Uh, first up, we have, I think for 10 minutes each, uh, first up, we have Dr. Ken Giller. Uh, Dr. Giller is professor in plant production systems from Wageningen University in the Center for Agroecology and Systems Analysis. Uh, Dr. Giller's research has focused on smallholder farming systems in sub-Saharan Africa, but also has emphasized uh, the dynamics, spatial and temporal dynamics of resources within crop and livestock farming systems. So I invite uh, Dr. Giller to uh, give his presentation. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed. Um, I hope you can see my screen already, Theresa. Yes, we can. We can hear you as well. Perfect. And uh, thanks very much to Theresa, to Rashid and all the others for organizing this uh, very interesting discussion today. 
Um, without further ado, I'd like then to talk particularly about regenerative agriculture. And I do this in um, relation to this uh, um, paper that we published just recently. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm just putting the link in the chat. So you have a, a URL in the chat there where you can find this uh, paper. So basically, what I'll do in this very short intervention is just go through basically the arguments that we put forward in this paper, and I hope that that'll help then to trigger the discussion today. So, first of all, regenerative agriculture in the news. When we did this, uh, this is actually from uh, a database called Nexus Lexus. You'll see from 2016, 17 onwards, the number of news items about regenerative agriculture has simply gone through the roof. Why is this? Well, it's attracting so much interest from so many different directions. We've got interest from NGOs, all of the big NGOs concerned with world conservation, multinational companies, the known General Mills, Kellogg's, Patagonia, the World Council for Sustainable Business Development. We've got charitable foundations. And there are many farmers with testaments on the uh, internet talking about regenerative agriculture, particularly on very large livestock farms in the US, in Australia, and in New Zealand. So here we are, Nestle supporting regenerative agriculture, General Mills, 1 million hectares of farmland, Danone, regenerative agriculture, Unilever, regenerative agriculture principles with implementation guide came out in March, I think this year. We've got um, Patagonia looking at regenerative organic agriculture. And one of the most recent was PepsiCo, who also came with a huge commitment. Many of these company commitments in the order of billions of dollars to strengthen regenerative agriculture in their supply chains. But again, we have some words of caution. Diana Martin from the Rodale Institute cautioned that it's it's a new buzzword. There's real danger of it becoming greenwashed. So what is regenerative agriculture? If we go into the literature, we find actually it really originates uh, very much from the Rodale Institute, really looking at a type of organic agriculture, um, one that uh, would uh, rely largely on soil biology, having basically little impact on the environment, removing biocides, uh, helping people make a trans transition to renewable rather than non-renewable resources. And Dick Harwood, who many of you might know as was the board, the chair of the board of TSBF, and I, I knew him in that role where I participated as well, the Tropical Soil Biology and Fertility Institute, also writing in 1983, needing high level planning, but a local, uh, regional self-reliance closing nutrient loops. But when we come then to the regenerative agriculture practices and principles, the principles are very much principles that we find as good agricultural practice. So things like uh, looking towards minimizing tillage, maintaining soil cover, so preventing erosion, building soil carbon, building more on biological nutrient cycles with diversity, livestock integration, avoiding pesticides, encouraging water percolation. Having said that, when we look at the practices which are being recommended, while many of them are maybe mainstream, like reduced tillage or uh, cover crops, many others are what we could call highly specific or maybe a bit on the fringe, things like permaculture, holistic grazing, uh, biochar, et cetera, which are maybe useful in specific circumstances, but maybe not everywhere. But you'll see there's a big focus on, on the soil, particularly through each of these different approaches. We could also argue that some of the approaches actually do have some issues, because if we're going for no biocides, but we're using zero till, of course, a lot of zero till systems depend on the use of herbicides. Equally, agroforestry and zero-till, we found, don't combine very well because of competition from tree roots, et cetera, et cetera. 
But there's this huge focus on carbon sequestration. Here's the website of the Carbon Underground. Look at all those people, uh, all those different organizations that are signing up. And yet at the same time, there are the future of agriculture here from um, California State University, where Dr. David Johnson's research on fungal dominated compost carbon sequestration, if you look at the claims here, he's claiming 20 to 50 times the currently observed soil carbon increase. Now it's impossible to find any publications to back this up and this is based on a, a particular type of compost which would provo provoke and support fungal dominated biomass in soil. Something that for me as a, as a soil biologist doesn't make a huge amount of sense actually. So we've got all sorts of activity, claims, counterclaims, and then caution being expressed here. Does overselling regenerative agriculture end up undercutting its potential? And when this came out, some of the claims being made of regenerative agriculture, even people who support regenerative agriculture, who support carbon sequestration, people like Ratan Lal actually said, come on guys, this has gone too far, we're overselling things. The only data I'll show or the only con concept I'll show here is this one about soil carbon and that is that basically if you look at the left, as you accumulate soil carbon you come to a new equilibrium and that means on, as on the right the rate of carbon accumulation decreases towards that equilibrium. So we can't continue to build soil carbon at high rates indefinitely. So the main points of critique in our article are that basically given the huge diversity of agriculture globally, the challenges that agriculture faces vary over time and space. And yet very little attention is given to those starting points. Particular for me, I work very much in Africa in smallholder systems, which are devoid of nutrients. And for those to start talking about reducing inputs this absolutely doesn't make sense. Whereas of course, where I live in the Netherlands, where we have an oversupply of animal manures and, and nutrients, we need to reduce. A second big point for me there is that agrochemicals are all bundled into one. Whereas the concerns for human and environmental health of pesticides, which are basically toxic and intentionally toxic, and those of fertilizers, which don't have the same toxicity, are all bundled under the same banner. In all of the discussion of regenerative agriculture, there's very little attention given to pest and disease control. And yet integrated pest and disease management moving towards the future is gonna be one of our biggest challenges as we try and reduce dependence on pesticides. And then finally here, the focus is very much on the farm. There's very little consideration about the ecological footprint of agriculture or the land sparing arguments. So all is about biodiversity on the farm. But if we're going to reduce production in terms of the, the productivity of agriculture, then we're going to have a bigger ecological footprint in terms of indirect land use change elsewhere. So we came up with some questions that we think need to be answered by agronomists who want to engage with regenerative agriculture. So what are the pro problems? What's to be regenerated? How can we do that agronomically? And how can we then make sure that that practice is something which is realistic and fits into context in an economic and socially viable way? And lastly, what are these broader forces, political, social, or economic, which will drive the use of the practice. So why did I write this paper? Well, first of all, I was really confused. What is regenerative agriculture? Why is there so much enthusiasm, which seems to outweigh all of the science? There seem to be so many unfounded and exaggerated claims. And I'm basically allergic to, to practices and approaches which say, these are the rules, you have to do it like this, because we know that the world is such a big, variable complex space and we need actually nuanced approaches to address that and it seemed to me there are many more important issues in the world that need attention rather than coming up with new terms and terminology that nobody can define 
to finish off with, well, what is truly regenerative? Well, basically agriculture based on two fundamentally renewable resources of photosynthesis, capture of carbon from the air, biological nitrogen fixation in terms of capturing nitrogen from this limitless resource we have in the atmosphere and best through biological means, of course. And here we are, what I've spent my whole career working on, nitrogen fixing legumes, whether they're grain legumes, forages, trees, or green manures, have got to be part of the picture. Last slide, sustainability is for your parents. This Twitter handle has been used very widely around regenerative agriculture. Sustainability is the old school, we need to move forward, but I fundamentally don't agree that sustainability is a redundant concept. I mean, thanks to my co-authors on the paper, uh, I'll finish there. Thanks, Teresa. Uh, thank you very much, Ken, for, for this uh, very uh, succinct presentation where you also covered a lot uh, about some of the, the, the big debates that inform um, this, uh, the, the work that, you're, that, that you decided to write. Um, so let's go on to our next speaker and then maybe we'll have a, a chance uh, for people to ask questions in the chat um, and, and people are starting to do so. Please uh, feel free to write uh, your questions on chat. Um, so our next speaker, I'd like to, I'm very pleased to invite uh, Dr. Bruce, Bruce Campbell, Director of the CGIAR Research Program on Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, um, as we all know as CCAT. Um, in 2009, Bruce became the director of the newly established CGIAR Challenge Program on Climate Change, um, based at the University of Copenhagen. And in 2011, he became the director of what we know as CCAFs today. Um, and Dr. Bruce Campbell also comes to us with a PhD in ecology from Utrecht University. So um, uh, Bruce, you're very welcome. 10 minutes. Great. Thanks Thank a lot. So I've been asked to talk about climate smart agriculture. What is it? Uh, what are some of the challenges and successes? And what are the, some of the ways we can speed up implementation? Uh, so I'm hardly, I don't think I need for this crowd to really say what it is. We've, we've, we know that's an attempt to deal with adaptation, to deal with mitigation, and to deal with uh, productivity and food security. Many of the outputs that we seek, increased production, increased net returns for farmers, input use efficiency, reduction in emissions, resilience, increased gender and social inclusions, these things are common to many different agricultural approaches. And when we're thinking about climate smart agriculture, we're thinking about being weather smart, and I'm going to give lots of examples of that one. Water smart, dealing with the water issues because it's so crucial to adaptation. Seeds and breeds, thinking about drought resistance, etc. Carbon and nutrient smart, putting carbon in the soils, uh, being very efficient in terms of nutrient use. And perhaps most important, the last box, being institutionally and market smart. But I want to step back from climate smart agriculture and here's something I 100% agree with Ken. Here are all the terms I have experienced in my career in terms of describing very similar things with huge overlaps. Sustainable agriculture, sustainable intensification, regenerative agriculture. The latest one is perhaps nature-based solutions and climate smart agriculture is one of these as well. And I take a bet with anybody in the audience that in five years time, we'll be arguing and discussing about a new term. What context specific activities need to happen in specific locations is a much better way of approaching what we need to think about. And it's a little bit like what Ken was saying as well, what are the good agricultural practices that we need to place in different places? What are the sustainable agricultural practices? So I'm not a I'm not a I'm not going to be a proponent for climate smart agriculture in this presentation because I think many of these words cover what we're interested in. But let's look at some of the climate challenges. Is a group estimated that we need a one gigaton emission reduction target by 2030. We estimate that we've only got 30% of the technologies needed to achieve that target. So there's a massive mitigation target 
for agriculture coming up. But for smallholder farmers, perhaps the, the target is even more difficult. If we believe in the SDGs and we want them to happen by 2030, we have nine cropping seasons left in many countries to trial new ways of doing business. And in that time, we have to reach half a billion small scale producers to reach them, empower them and build their resilience to extreme events. So Climate Smart Agriculture is doing some of, attempting to get to some of these goals. But of course, many of those other terms are equally uh, aiming at these things. What are the challenges for Climate Smart Agriculture? And I don't think that they're real. T for me, the technology challenges are not so great. I think it is getting finance into the system, bringing finance into the agricultural sector getting value chains working for small scale producers. Ken mentioned legume systems. Are there markets for legumes? Let's think about the markets and what needs to happen. Policy and institutional and regulatory barriers. And the last one, getting the information to farmers, climate informed advi advisories. So they get seasonal forecasts to know what to expect. And during the season, they get climate advisories. But these advisories also link to other services, insurance, banking, market intelligence. So those are some of the bigger challenges that I see if we're really going to achieve the SDGs. I want to now look at just some of the successes. And yeah, I can, although the challenges are pretty daunting, I'm still quite hopeful because I've seen some really wonderful things happen in the last few years. This is a totally new forecasting system for Vietnam in the Mekong Delta. We've been working only a few years together with the national government. It's now been applied to 800,000 hectares or nearly a million hectares, half a million rice growers. It hel helps them to decide when to change, when to plant and, and uh, at which date they should get their crops going. The, the impact uh, studies that we've now done show an increase, an increase in annual rice incomes by 24%. The Vietnam government at the same time is also working really seriously on mitigation and putting alternate wetting and drying in rice, this fantastic technology where you can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And they're aiming for significant greenhouse gas reductions by 2030 and have already achieved some of those. I mentioned climate informed advisories as a key way forward. And we've seen some amazing progress here as well. 7 million farmers in Senegal now getting at, uh, climate informed advisory, advisories in the last few years, 500,000 going digital, 100,000 plus farmers in Rwanda, 300,000 farmers in Ghana, 13 million farmers in Ethiopia getting radio messages. So sometimes it's digital, sometimes it's radio. Sometimes it's a mixture. And we've done impact studies in Senegal and Rwanda. The other studies are still coming, which shows that if farmers know what to expect and they're getting good advisories, there's increased uptake of technologies. Incomes are increasing by approximately 20%. In Rwanda, the gender gap between male and female almost totally disappeared amongst the farmers taking up the, the advisories. I also mentioned policy and institutional engagement. So in Kenya, there's been a continuous policy engagement over many years now. This has seen some major things happening. 250 million new investments in climate smart agriculture. They estimate approximately a million farmers taking up uh, CSA practices. And the, the impact studies that have just come out show livestock holdings up, agricultural yield up, and above all, poverty reduced, so household welfare increased. So we're seeing some real things happening on the ground. I talked about markets for smallholder farmers. This is quite an amazing and an ambitious uh, activity in Rwanda. So it's, it's by Africa Improved Foods. They've put these factories that you can see in the picture in place, but perhaps most important, they they're focusing on smallholder value chains. They're looking for smallholders to provide them the input into their, their factories. 
They now plan to expand to five countries. So this is massive private sector investment, much more than the development or the climate community can ever bring in terms of public funds. But the public sector can help by helping de-risking and thus leveraging private sector investment. And then of course we have to work on the value chains and that's part of the, 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 propo the proposal and current work where we're building resilience into the value chains and making them more carbon friendly. I want to go quickly just to some of the ways we, we've seen scaling happen. So we've got something called CSA plan where we go through a whole series of steps situation analysis, prioritizing interventions, then doing the actual implementation as advisors and monitoring and evaluation. I just wanted to focus on the first one, situation analysis. So this is profiling CSA. It's working, we've done it in roughly 30 countries globally now. In some countries, right down to county level. So this is 31 counties have been doing, climate risk profiles. Overall, thousands of experts are consulted. So it's a very participatory approach. It's done together with national experts. And for example, this is one of the reasons the it's been uh, informed the 250 million investment in CSA in Kenya. So what is what are these profiles? And if you look at the orange lever there, Understanding climate change and variability, this climate smartness of various practices and technologies, dealing with policies and institutions, the financing opportunities, people and agriculture, thinking of the bigger land use and the landscape issues and greenhouse gas emissions. So it's looking at all of these things uh, within a country and, and uh, with national experts. I've, I think this is my final slide. Uh, so on our website, there's a whole bunch of resources in terms of country profiles. It's, it goes through the mechanisms and how to do it. Investment planning. So the next step after that is actually looking for real concrete cases to invest in uh, small older value chains. There's a, a whole sustainable finance area. So we're the first, I think we're the first CGIR program in the, in, it, within the CGIR to to actually hire, we have five finance experts coming from the finance sector in that we really believe that if we're going to scale CSA to the point we need it, we have to get more finance, pri private sector finance. And there's also a CSA guide uh, on the website, which goes through all the technologies, pr approaches and practices dealing with trade-offs, etc. So in summary, there are some really significant challenges ahead. Let's not waste our time arguing over words and approaches. We need to focus on what needs to happen in particular places. And for us, some of the crucial things to deal with are the policy and institutional environment, private sector and the value chains, bringing much more finance into agriculture and getting information and advisories to farmers and the associated services. Thanks very much, Teresa. Thank you so much, Bruce, for that presentation. Um, if I may, I'm, I'm, um, these two are really complimentary presentations and there were really uh, great messages that came through that can take us through to the next uh, the part of the webinar. Um, we're seeing actually Bruce's uh, presentation, which gives us some very interesting entry points. You know, where do we start with CSA? Um, and I'm quite pleased to see that, you know, work on value chains and de-risking is actually in there. Just to remind us that maybe the old concept of CSA um, now has to be expanded to, to look at all the different parts of the, the value chain, the agricultural value chain that also influence sustainability, not just the production or on-farm side as also uh, can refer to. Um, so this is the two presentations. Presentations really remind us uh, to ask what are the, the good agricultural practices that have that should happen for a particular place. And this is a reminder that of the of the context specificity of of so many of these practices, taking into account landscapes, our our ecosystems, uh, and our social uh, cultural contexts. 
uh, a reminder to us all to be a bit more flexible and less rigid um, and to argue less about names. I don't know how easy it is institutionally to, to um, not have that <laughs> going on, but I think that's it's a very cogent reminder that a lot of good work is going on in spite of, uh, of, um, of these polemics, perhaps. Um, so this is a really good reminder. Sustainability is definitely not dead or for for uh, other generations, we are grappling with this and this is why we have this uh, webinar. So um, yes, I'm very, old, and, and maybe taking on and just thinking about these entry points that were presented to us uh, in, in Ken's and, and Bruce's presentation, where do we begin uh, with this work and, and, and what is it that creates the success that we want to see in terms of, of making agriculture smart for climate, smart for shops. Um, so I think with, without, um, and with, I think on that note, I'd like to, uh, to pass the floor to Jean-Marc Fauré, who will take over uh, for, the, for the, the session ahead, um, speaking to our three panelists. Jean-Marc. Thank you, Teresa. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. This is really an exciting session where we have uh, now uh, more than uh, 380 uh, uh, participants and still growing it shows it shows the interest for the subject uh, this uh, can tell you it is our record for these zoominars so we are we are really very pleased to to see the interest and uh, uh, for a discussion on these subjects we uh, we will now uh, have a, a conversation with uh, three panelists and I will uh, introduce them now. Uh, we have uh, Jacques Wery, who, is, uh, who has recently joined the Institut Agro in France. But just before that, he was the Deputy Director General for Research uh, at the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas, ICARDA, which uh, focuses a lot on our region. He's an agronomist with a vast experience in uh, Mediterranean crop and cropping systems. And uh, his interdisciplinary research approaches and his systems analysis covered the plant, field, farm, and the supply chain level. So very much uh, in line with what we have just uh, heard. We have with us also uh, my colleague, uh, Robin uh, Sessa, who is uh, working uh, in the Office of Climate, Biodiversity, and Environment uh, in FAO. Uh, until last year, Robin was part of the team in charge of mainstreaming sustainable agriculture uh, in FAO's World Pro Work Program. And uh, it's also interesting to know that uh, in the years 2010, Ro Robin was directly involved in the preparation of the FAO Climate Smart Agriculture Source Book. And uh, he also supported the development of the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. And uh, uh, last but not least, we have uh, Melle Leinstra. Uh, Melle works for the Dutch Ministry of Agriculture, uh, and nat uh, Nature and Food Quality, and he's agriculture counselor to Egypt and Jordan, based here in Cairo, where he helps connecting uh, Dutch agribusiness knowledge and expertise with partners in Egypt and, and Jordan. He's a, a social scientist, and he is passionate about the urgency to co-create sustainable, healthy, and inclusive food systems. So welcome uh, to our panelists. And uh, if you allow me, I will ask uh, the first uh, question to Jacques Wery. Uh, Jacques, uh, uh, first I would like to have from you a quick reaction on the two uh, presentations that uh, uh, we have just uh, uh, seen and heard. Uh, and then I would like to ask you, where does the regional agronomic research stand on CSA, on agroecology, on sustainable intensification, uh, on regenerative agriculture, to support family farming in the drylands of the Near East and North Africa region? Jacques, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, um, Jean-Marc, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm trying to combine the, the, your two questions in one, uh, coming back, uh, reflecting on the presentation uh, made by Ken and Bruce, and uh, deriving some uh, points for discussion about uh, the implication for the uh, MENA region. Nena region. Oops. 
I'm sorry. We see the. Yeah, you see the presentation, but I have a, I have a problem for the, um, the slide. So, let me start again. Okay, I cannot change the slide. So, um, can you pass yourself the, the presentation? No, now it's okay. This is okay. Yes. It can. So the first thing I wanted to highlight, and uh, it has already been said, that uh, there is a growing list of uh, what we can call uh, types of agriculture or frame uh, of agriculture. And I think this does not help uh, farmers, advisors, investors, and policymakers to, to understand uh, and to, to make priorities. And uh, I've just put some example here. Of the, of the recent four, um, form of agriculture that uh, beyond the, the three we discussed today. Uh, the reason why it doesn't help so much is the first, there is generally a mix of the objective in the way they are dis defined. There is a mix of the objective, for example, sequestering carbon, increasing soil biodiversity, which can be reached by many different ways. And uh, this is mixed with the principle to, for the system management. The second thing is uh, the scientific concepts uh, on the agroecosystem management tend also to be diluted by the inclusion of the enabling context in the system, typically the food system, the equity, the social dimension. Of course, it's very important to, to, to consider them, uh, but the fact that they are also in some form of agriculture included in it does not uh, facilitate. And the essence of the concept tend to, tend to be lost when scaling. I mean, I'm coming back to what Bruce has presented. It's not easy to scale the, together the three principles of the climate smart agriculture, the adaptation, mitigation, and food security. And there may be a tendency to, to scale one of the dimension. Next slide, please. Okay. The, the other point is all these form of, of type of agriculture have in common the soil, uh, soil health, soil, soil fertility, and the agrobiodiversity, uh, and the, the fact that these two needs to be managed related to the concept. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I think it's, it's one of the, um, um, the, the, the pillars that you would find in any form of, uh, um, of uh, agriculture. Uh, the question uh, then comes more on how you manage, uh, for example, the link between the two, and for example, the biomass production, uh, which uh, is and the biomass allocation. Do you allocate more biomass for for the food system or more for the soil? And the dependency on the water and the nutrient uh, availability of this biomass production, and especially for the Nena region, the question of water driving biomass production uh, is uh, frequently uh, forgotten. And as uh, Ken has mentioned also, pest, disease, weed management, and the question of pesticide use are generally poorly integrated in the definition and the principle of this form of agriculture. The, uh, Ken has also emphasized this, but I think it's important to remind that the systems improvement depend also on the initial state of the system and the, and the way the, the flows uh, uh, in and out of the systems are managed. And the first thing to consider is both may be very variable across the landscape and across the field. And uh, this um, makes the, the, the improvement more um, important. Just to illustrate, I think, to come back to the previous uh, question of uh, biomass allocation, uh, um, a very important aspect uh, to go from an initial state, for example, of soil uh, fertility to uh, uh, a target state is uh, what is the strategy between using the biomass for, for food, for livestock or soil. And uh, uh, I just cite here the example of legumes. I mean, the dual purpose food legumes like uh, lentil are, are very uh, important crops in the region. But if you use both the grain for, for, for food and uh, the straw for feed, 
it is likely that the effect would be much, much lower on, on soil than a green manure, with, even with the same crops. There is also then the difficulty, if we all agree that we need to develop context-based solution, there is a difficulty of how you scale this to a country level. Bruce has already also touched on that. Uh, the basic idea is that the, to have a productive system with less input and more ecosystem services mean that these systems are more complex to design and manage. They are more dependent on the context and the different uh, types of contexts, uh, not only biophysical, but also socioeconomic. Very, very much uh, sensitive to initial state. Uh, not, I gave the example of soil carbon, but the capital of the farmers may also um, um, raise the same type of question of the importance of the initial state in the trajectory. And the scaling is therefore more demanding because you need to scale a bundle of solution uh, to reach a, a level. So more demanding for stakeholder capacity development at all level, more demanding also for time and funding. So one of the, uh, of the idea from that is we really need in the region more research on development on scaling of these complex and context-based systems. The, the other point I wanted to remind is the importance of water as a, and the risk mitigation, uh, both in rainfall, but also um, the economic risk. And in the NENA region, the question of water availability, water quality, and water equity are, are very important across the different systems. And I will stop with this last slide. Some consideration for discussion uh, for the region. Uh, the first thing is we should not org organize the research for development and the capacity development, including in the university, by type of agriculture, uh, for the reason we, we have already mentioned. We should be clear in each project and context on the target we want to achieve, which criteria, the time scales and the trade-off, taking into consideration in the region the, the water availability and quality. Soil health, agrobiodiversity, and input management, as well as market linkage, are really core in, in whatever the, the form of agriculture we refer to, especially in the context of food system and climate change. And it's important to the theory of change, the project strategy, and the policies are built on, a dive, on the idea that there is a diversity of initial states and context. <clears throat> and the last point is, to engage with public and private policy and finance, there is still a need to define some form of agriculture, which are meaningful for food system stakeholders. The success of organic farming, I think it is really coming from the linkage uh, with, the, with the market and the recognition and the understanding uh, by the farmers of what it means. I'm, and secondly, which can be actionable in national program development plan. And here I come back to what Bruce was presenting. The, the, the climate, uh, the CSA national plan, I think are, are a good example. It goes beyond the principle of, of CSA, but it is built on this principle uh, so that it's uh, easier to, for the stakeholder consultation and the national uh, development. Thank you, I'm stopping here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just a, a, a quick, uh, a few words about uh, what I heard and certainly uh, not giving justice to the richness of your presentation. The importance of uh, soil health and agrobiodiversity as entry point. The need to differentiate wh wh when we speak about practice or when we speak about the broader enabling environment. The fact that, that in particular in our region, water drives uh, biomass production and therefore everything turns around the water including uh, trade-offs and conflicts on biomass use uh, the importance of um, scaling is something that is uh, fundamentally context specific and then one uh, sentence that i really liked uh, more sustainable uh, systems are more complex and more context specific and therefore the response is a much more knowledge rich agriculture and that has big implication on the research that uh, uh, you needed to apply uh, in this region, but I guess this is a uh, very valid everywhere.
and the key word of diversity, of course. Thank you. Uh, uh, let me turn now to uh, a, a Ruben. Uh, Ruben, uh, you are in FAO. So tell us, how does FAO reconcile its work streams on CSA, agroecology, sustainable intensification? And how can CSA and agroecological methodologies be used to guide appropriate practices and interventions that can contribute to the transition towards a more sustainable agri-food system? You have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Well, um, I think um, the, the previous speakers have sort of replied to the first part of the question that, in fact, uh, FAO doesn't have to reconcile those different concepts because they actually fundamentally have huge overlaps. So they all address that the, the issue that agriculture has to achieve multiple goals and reduce the trade-offs that it's causing. So um, as we've seen in both agroecology, CSA and other principles, we need to increase productivity and income and food security, but we have to reduce uh, negative uh, impacts and ensure sustainability of the natural resource base on which we rely. Now, the, the issue of these concepts is that um, often we actually create or have the risk of creating distortions by putting emphasis on one or more of these components rather than addressing it in a holistic manner. So let me um, take the CSA example, which is the one that is uh, the one maybe that I'm closest to, is that when we originally conceived CSA, we, we realized that there was a, a lot of parallel tracks in both adaptation mitigation, both inside the UNFCC negotiations, but also at the implementation level. So actually, the, um, you could actually create systems that actually have multiple benefits. So that's why we created uh, the CSA in ensuring both mitigation and where possible, like uh, adaptation are, are both addressed at the same time. Now, but actually, when you actually look at the CSA concept and you break it down, it actually has uh, the three um, fundamental um, pillars of sustainability, economic, uh, environmental, and social, and addresses like uh, the dimensions of food, secu uh, food security and nutrition. So availability, accessibility, utilization, and stability. But because it's been put in these three pillars of uh, productivity, adaptation and mitigation. Often these uh, other like multiple benefits are actually forgotten when you actually see how CSA is implemented on the ground. Uh, maybe I could say that agroecology is, um, has a, uh, approached it in a more maybe vigorous way and has the ten main elements and a stronger emphasis on ecosystem services, reducing the need for external inputs and has a strong governance, social and cultural elements. Actually, uh, when when uh, agroecology first came out, I actually thought that that's definitely where um, CSA can improve. And I think uh, these concepts actually can improve and learn from each other. There's always ways uh, to evolve and, and strengthen themselves. But um, as the other speakers have mentioned, the real reality is that you can have all the concepts you like, but when you hit the ground, you have to look at the main challenges at that farm, that community, and that, um, let's say, uh, landscape level. And the bottom line is that uh, we have to balance the, the key priorities on the ground with um, the available like uh, technology systems and the capacities of the stakeholders. So a bit like what Bruce said that in, in the end, like uh, the key, let's say bottlenecks for like the adoption of these uh, concepts is often the enabling environment, like uh, the knowledge, the actual access to services like finance, and adequate policy and legislation setups. And uh, unless we address these, and you know, often we're actually quite weak on these aspects, we're not actually gonna get the scaling up and sustainability that we're looking for. Um, and that the level of institutional setup in FAO, uh, I should mention uh, that all, all these sustainability concepts are under our um, strategic objective and particular strategic objective too, that make agriculture more productive and sustainable. Most of the concepts have actually been endorsed by our governing bodies, for example, the Committee on Agriculture, COAG. And in particular, like our regional conferences have specifically uh, highlighted some of the interventions and needs that they, they require. But I think most interesting of all is um, FAO's country programming frameworks. This is the agreements that happen 
between uh, FAO and the country on what the major interventions that are required uh, by the country and where they want FAO support. And as we see, there's a growing uh, request for both uh, CSA, agroecology, and these other concepts. And FAO is now working in a more coordinated manner to actually address these specific needs. But these needs are very uh, context specific and uh, related to specific issues. So we're actually analyzing at the country level exactly what uh, the capacity is needed, whether if it's in uh, water management or pest uh, control or whatever. And do we have the expertise in FAO or do we need to actually combine our like strengths with external organizations? Now, um, coming to the, the second part of the question of like how CSA, agroecology, other methodology can actually help in uh, creating these transitions. First, I think um, they're interested in the fact in creating their community of practice. So for CSA, we have GAXA and other major groups working on CSA. Agroecology also has a strong partnership base. And um, these groups can actually support the, the knowledge base and the evidence base and like the development of tools to actually uh, help uh, in the context specific uh, decision making and identification of optimal interventions. So, um, for example, it was already mentioned that agroecology has um, the tool for agroecological performance evaluation tape and uh, CSA, we're now developing an assessment framework to understand how sustainable a farm or landscape interventions currently are. And then um, with, with the agroecology team actually developing uh, a system where like the major deficiencies or issues at hand that need to be addressed in that uh, farm or landscape level um, uh, identifies practices and interventions from FAOs like catalog and inventory systems of uh, practices and briefs and so forth. Um, and uh, I should say that both of these systems are actually based um, fundamentally on the SDG rationale. So um, like when we're measuring sustainability, we're trying to link it as closely as possible to the SDG indicators, in particular, uh, the indicators under 2.3, and which is on agricultural productivity and income, and 2.5 on uh, sustainable ag systems, but also other indicators like land rights, biodiversity, and so forth. So there's two reasons for this. One is like, um, these are like statistically sound, but also because um, national systems already have to measure these indicators. So this actually ensures that we um, integrate rather than creating new parallel tracks, creating an extra burden on the countries themselves. Uh, I think another major issue where we can provide support, which we're um, currently working on, is um, I, as we mentioned, these systems are very context specific. And like uh, we have to increasingly create them um, multiple like uh, co-benefits when we're developing these ag systems. And this requires a lot of like data and information, both GIS data, point data, and so forth. And um, often like um, our country counterparts find it very difficult to actually um, uh, use all this data, uh, both at the national scale, but also at the farm level scale. So at the moment we're trying to develop um, uh, like I say, um, user-friendly systems, which integrate the, the point and uh, uh, land and GIS data like soil, water, climate, and so forth, into user-friendly systems, which help that decision-making process. And uh, ultimately, what we want to actually then build on these platforms is like a two-way process where like farmers become also like uh, the generators and custodians of the data that can actually support us in understanding what's happening on the ground, where we have sort of like a citizen science or a farm science system where we can actually quickly apprehend what is happening. So for example, you know, we, we're looking at modules where we can have um, quick uh, immediate responses on pest outbreaks or modules on PDNA for reporting disasters and so forth. So creating these systems we hope will actually then uh, support the farmers in their decision making and also reduce the risks in uh, when making these transitions. Um, uh, lastly, what I wanted to mention was that these concepts shouldn't be static, like the world is evolving, as we can see, uh, and can often evolve when we least expect it, for example, the COVID-19 situation. 
CSA has been like now um, over 10 years uh, when it's first creation. And we have to like keep up with the time. So, you know, we can think about like a CSA plus, which addresses the SDGs and these new uh, issues and make sure that we're ensuring the tools and methodologies to in ensure that our, our national counterparts can create systems which meet these demands. Uh, back to you, John Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you reiterated what we heard earlier about uh, the huge overlap between the approach and the fact that uh, basically what all these approaches aim at is addressing multiple goals. Uh, this has a negative uh, element, which is that uh, this means uh, uh, often managing trade-offs, but it also has, uh, like in the example you gave of CSA, uh, uh, building uh, multiple benefits and, and seeking how we can uh, uh, look at uh, uh, enhancing the synergies and, and reducing the trade-offs. Um, you also uh, focused a lot on um, a first on one side the the, the community on practice uh, also the uh, the governance process by which FAO uh, internalizes these uh, concepts and and the very the great importance of assessment uh, and that is the that is really it's uh, on one side very difficult assessing uh, uh, concepts like sustainability, but also very much needed to be able to uh, uh, to monitor and to, to say whether we uh, we see progress or not. And you link this to the SDG monitoring, which is a kind of a everybody's agenda. Uh, and indeed, the SDG indicators, they might not be perfect, they might not be comprehensive, but they are there and they are uh, they are acknowledged and uh, they, they are a reference. You also uh, spoke in terms of uh, assessment of uh, the exciting elements related to uh, new tools like GIS or uh, uh, what I would call crowdsourcing, where farmers become uh, also the producer of the information and, and of, as well as uh, obviously the, uh, the users. So um, a, a series of very important elements. I just wanted to add uh, in preparation for uh, this meeting, I went to see, you know, there is, a, there is an interesting process, a, a, a committee called the Committee on World Food Security, that is a multi-sectoral uh, committee, uh, FAO is the secretariat, and uh, uh, this is a forum for countries and stakeholders to uh, examine uh, complex issues and to uh, and to agree on how to on how to address them and very recently they have asked a, a series of experts to give their opinion about agroecology and other innovative approach and that's very much related to what we are discussing here today and uh, this committee is now negotiating what it wants to uh, to get from this, what it wants to, what recommendations it wants to give, give to countries, to development institutions, etc. And it is a very, it is an ongoing process right now, and it is a very, very exciting and a, a complex a process because it is a complex subject. Um, so now let me turn to our third panelist, uh, Mele. Uh, good afternoon. Let me ask you, from a development partner perspective in, in our region, uh, how do you see the main challenges to agriculture and food security in the Near East and North Africa? And how do you advise on investment in research and development and agricultural development agenda for our region? Hello, you Thank, you. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm honored to be sharing a Zoominar with such, uh, such eminent uh, speakers. I really feel pri uh, privileged to have this opportunity. At the same time, I must say that I'm also embarrassed to be one of a bunch of white men talking about sustainable agriculture in, in the MENA region. Um, feeling uncomfortable about this, I asked our gender advisor, Caroline Nassif, um, at the embassy, uh, what to do. And she said, well, be honest, say that you're honored, but also make the point on uh, diversity. And that sounded good to me because being a Dutchman, I'm used to be bluntly honest. Um, so I, I apologize by, by doing that in my presentation. I'm also happy that uh, Bruce took note of this and, uh, and that this violated gen CGIR gender policy and that the organizers took mitigating action. 
As for the fact that there's a dominance of EU-based experts in this conversation, uh, this is an issue also to take note of. But it's also understandable because there's quite a societal push uh, in the EU uh, for action on sustainable agriculture. Um, and also in culturally similar societies like North Africa and Australia, you see the same. At the same time here within the MENA, uh, there seems to be less societal demand for this, uh, this agenda uh, as people have other priorities. Just last week, my colleague Omar Abdelatif and I hosted a food for thought iftar uh, with the next generation of Egyptian agri-food professionals. And I asked them to share their passion for working in agri-food. And I asked them to explain which is the most important for them, people, planet, or profit. I was happy that there were many who were passionate about impacting on other people's lives. Some were so honest to prioritize profit as a precondition to be able to help others. Planet, however, was a bit of an afterthought at best. For us in the Netherlands, however, Ecological sustainability in agriculture is not an afterthought. We long pr uh, prided ourselves for being, as a tiny country, the second agricultural exporter worldwide, uh, that we had contributed to, uh, contributed to food security and banishing hunger uh, by maximizing agricultural productivity. Now, however, uh, it is clear that the ecological cost of that farming uh, system is so high that our society no longer accepts business as usual. Our minister, Carola Schouten, a farmer's daughter, um, our minister for agriculture, that is, uh, she um, has prioritized circular agriculture uh, as a pol policy priority. And we have an international strategy on sustainable uh, agriculture. Um, and sustainability is integral to our uh, international cooperation, trade and investment uh, promotion agenda. Due to the societal uh, interest, uh, sustainable agriculture has become a bit of a hype, as we saw in, uh, in Ken Giller's presentation. And Ken Giller's uh, uh, and his colleagues' uh, excellent paper is a fitting reaction uh, to this, at times, unguided enthusiasm. Now, my great takeaway from this paper uh, was the author's concern for a lack of conceptual clarity. And I understand that there's a desire for research agronomists to have conceptual clarity. What are we talking about? Regenerative agriculture, CSA, or is it just proper farming? As a policymaker who wants to see a transition to more sustainable agriculture, I'm less concerned about conceptual clarity. I'm more interested in finding these stretchable terms that are a rallying call and that get great coalitions of people uh, ready to work together and take action. Uh, that is, uh, has appealed to both agribusinesses as well as uh, activist agroecological uh, agro activists. Uh, we want uh, both a civic society and agribusiness to take their responsibility. Now, what do we do here in the region? We have just started on this agenda here in the region. Previously, our priority was for a long time, and understandably so, water efficient greenhouse production, as you see in the, in the picture behind me, how to produce as much for a growing population with as little water as, as possible. But we also found that these high-tech, mid-tech uh, uh, greenhouses were outside of the investment perspectives of a lot of agri uh, agripreneurs in this, uh, in this area. Since I started in this position just before Corona, um, I've been very curious about what, what we can do uh, with soil-based, more nature-inclusive agriculture, uh, and try to see if we can uh, increase diversity and use fewer chem chemical inputs. Now, just last week, I was pleased to get the green light from our headquarters uh, to work with Wageningen Research uh, and with others to explore opportunities for more sustainable farming systems in Egypt. Uh, to look for opportunities for lighthouse farms to inspire conventional agriculture to work with agroecological principles and become more sustainable. There already is a lighthouse farm here in the region, uh, here in uh, Egypt, uh, and it's called Sikem. Uh, the Abu Laish family uh, has been working for over four decades on biodynamic production for local markets and exports. Um, but uh, and, and they, in doing so, they've created, uh, created great res uh, results and inspiration, but with limited upscaling potential, if you ask me, um, and little replication potential. Um, I recently brought a friend of mine, um, a rich Egyptian, who's uh, part of a conglomerate family business, uh, 
besides the chemical business, they're engaged in, uh, in dairy farming. Uh, they have 200 water buffaloes, uh, 400 water buffaloes and 200 uh, uh, Holstein Friesians. Now, he is interested to become more sustainable, but the biodynamic uh, ideology of Seiken was far removed from his uh, profit-oriented reality. Now, I'm interested in discovering what farming systems uh, uh, can make agroecological, economic and agronomic sense. Uh, and are so uh, socially and culturally acceptable to, to agripreneurs that are already in, the, in, in farming as a business. Um, we have to look broader than just certified organic, uh, but also look at integrated soil fertility management, integrated pest management, integrated uh, uh, weed management, uh, and use uh, uh, various uh, uh, integrated seed systems uh, to get propagation material and to, and to develop new varieties. Um, so that means public action and, uh, and by CGIR and, and national agricultural systems and private action. But how do we get this action to create impact on sustainable agribusiness? For me, the answer is inclusive partnerships. We have to go beyond the traditional state-led national agricultural research center uh, model uh, for um, uh, and national extension model uh, for getting farmers to do what researchers and policy makers think is right. Rather, we have to try to facilitate uh, and incubate uh, what we in the Netherlands like to call the diamond uh, uh, approach or Dutch diamond approach or Egyptian diamond approach, Jordanian diamond approach uh, to uh, agricultural knowledge and innovation systems that starts with farmers and their realities and is supported by agribusiness, knowledge institutes, civic society and governments. But inclusiveness also means uh, being inclusive in which farmers we work with. Um, and I have the impression that uh, at the moment, uh, donor funded agencies like FAO and like CGIR, uh, they have a smallholder bias. Uh, they focus on smallholders for understandable reasons because post poverty alleviation is an important objective. But if we also want to score on SDG 2.4, uh, which is uh, uh, working on a sustainable uh, a transition to sustainable agriculture, uh, we have to look beyond smallholders as well. We have to look at those commercial farmers uh, with access to markets, uh, with access uh, to, to some uh, investment funds, um, and with the ability to invest into new technologies and practice, and who have the opportunities to take risks, which small scale farmers cannot because they're busy surviving. Uh, and innovation and technology adoption takes risks. Let these big guys lead the way uh, and make sure that uh, they have inclusive business models uh, so that the small ones can, uh, can follow. Diversity is key. Uh, recently, IFPRI uh, did a study on uh, climate adaptation in, in the MENA region, and uh, their conclusion was there's a need for a suite of technologies uh, and practices to allow farmers to adapt to climate change. Um, the challenge of this, and, and Jacques Wery also made that point, is that uh, climate smart uh, practices and technologies are knowledge intensive and, and require quite the complexity. We have to realize that there's a reason that far farmers like monocultures. They're simple and it's easy to master and perfect uh, 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 monoculture systems. And we're dealing with the diversity that's needed um, is much more complex. Uh, and farmers need a knowledge and innovation system to support them in that complexity. So if we want to make a transition to sustainable farming systems that deliver on SDG 12.4, it's important that donor funded agencies change their narrative and move beyond uh, only looking at smallholders, working with commercial agriculture on sustainable and inclusive agribusiness. Let me leave it, uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mel, and uh, thank you for bringing uh, certainly a, a perspective from another angle uh, with your uh, background and uh, I like very much when you say I'm lost concerned about conceptual clarity uh, that many of us including me think is important but more about the momentum that these concepts can uh, can create. Uh, uh, you also give a very uh, very uh, 
concrete example of uh, a, a, the contrast between uh, what can be seen as a, uh, a, a dream in terms of agroecological practices and the difficulty to match this with a, with a profit uh, when you try to, and this is very much related to the scaling. Uh, uh, your point also uh, of uh, the importance of inclusive uh, partnership and your questioning or addressing the question of uh, should we look only at small scale farmers, because in particular when we discuss uh, sustainability, uh, we definitely need, need to look at uh, a, also those farmers that uh, are not in that category and that can indeed and are probably more and more willing to move towards um, a more sustainable practice. And finally, your point on diversity, which is so much connected to resilience and which is a word that everybody agrees on, but you said something I think is really true, is that uh, it's, it's, it doesn't come by itself. Uh, there are many reasons why farmers prefer non-diverse production, and one is also a scale economy. So uh, indeed, we have, we have to scrutinize every word, every concept, and see what, what meaning it has for different categories of farmers. So uh, I would like to thank uh, all three panelists for bringing their uh, perspective from different angles. I believe uh, this uh, gave a, a lot of uh, elements for our discussion. I'll give now uh, the floor back to Teresa as we enter into uh, the, uh, the last part on uh, the discussion, the question and answer. Teresa. Uh, thank you so much. Um, in this part, I think Jean-Marc and I will be selecting some questions from the chat. Um, we, we are trying to see which ones have been answered already, and um, if uh, they haven't yet, yeah, please uh, put your questions on chat and we'll do our best. Um, the first question was actually, I planned it, um, but Mele had to answer uh, or, or, or addressed it in, in a great detail, but we still continue to have these questions, so we, I want to try to summarize it. Um, perhaps a question to the speakers, maybe Bruce, uh, as he has given some examples, and also the panelists. What are some of the tested and best ways um, or mechanisms to, to bring CSA technologies to smallholder farmers? Um, in there, these questions have been raised about, for example, the, the um, climate ad advisory services. How do we reach these? How do we get this data to farmers to inform the decision making? So I want to use the, the maybe the concept that comes out from climate advisories, reaching farmers in the last mile. How do we bridge that stage? And we've already had a few ideas coming up from speakers. Uh, Mele has, has, has said quite a few. Um, Ruben has talked about user-based uh, co-creation of, 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 of platforms. Um, maybe other speakers who have not uh, yet addressed this, we can ask them to give one or two examples where this has happened in a very successful way. Perhaps Bruce and, and the examples that you brought up from Kenya, um, what were the success factors in, 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 in the uptake of CSA practices by smallholders? I mean, I, I guess I could talk about the, the Senegal example. This was getting uh, advice. I mean, as the others have said, it's very knowledge intensive, uh, CSA or agroecology. So this was about getting advisories to farmers. Um, <clears throat> the work actually started with uh, very participatory with men and women farmers, asking them what kind of information they actually need. It soon pro uh, moved on to developing local, very local platforms where it included uh, extension advisor, farmers group members, etc., so that they could get a platform where they could discuss the advisories that were coming from the national level. Um, and then it was working with radio stations to community radio stations to train broadcasters to deal with probabilistic uh, forecasts, because it's, you know, it's not, it's not a case that this is going to happen or not going to happen, they probabilistic. It was also working with the National Met Service to improve the forecasting system with the uh, the real the high tech end of the of forecasting with satellite uh, and remote sensing 
and was with some of the top climate scientists. So it was work right from the very farm level up to the to the national level. And as far as we're concerned, almost any big change we want has to accomplish those different levels of activity. And then what we would see on the ground was that farmers would get information from their local committee, local technical committee on which there were farmer representatives, and they would make the decisions themselves as to when to plant, what to plant, uh, uh, what varieties would be the best for the particular season, and those sort of things. And and we have evidence of, of that, that farmers then do make decisions which benefit their own welfare. So I, th you know, for me, uptake of CSA is not rocket science. It's all about uh, really working with farmers and and ultimately the farmers must make the decision on what to do. I hope that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bruce. I think that was a really nice level of detail. Um, is this any... Um, okay, um, I think we have uh, Ken who might want to make a response, hopefully related to one of these questions that might be asked. Ken, yeah, go sure. ahead. No, I'd, I'd really like to come back on a couple of things that Mel has said. And Mel and I do discuss more frequently, but so, so let's uh, just put that on the table. And I mean, Mel, I, I, you make the point in the beginning about about wanting, if you like, um, to have these these broad coalitions and everything pointing in the right direction. And I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think in many ways we have to embrace this idea that we've got so many different partners all saying, yes, we must do regenerative. But at the same point, <laughs> this is my caution, it has to mean something, and, and I'm not worried about definitions so much at the end of the day, but I'm worried about the claims that people make, and that's what really gets me, it's when people say, as they have done, we can lock up all the carbon in the atmosphere uh, that's needed to be locked up by doing it in soil, that's not possible. And, and by doing so, you start to think people say, okay, then we can carry on polluting, can't we, or, you know, we, we push attention away from clean energy to soil or whatever. So, I mean, I think absolutely, let's get everybody pointing in the right direction. We all want a better world, no question about that. But we have to actually use our, a voice of reason because otherwise we oversell things and the bubble bursts and everybody moves on, yeah? And what worries me there is that the farmers get left behind with nothing in their hands, having had all of this big, you know, political blah, blah, blah around it. So 100% agree with you on needing the narrative, but let's make it a narrative that we can translate in, in some ways with common sense, yeah? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have a lot of uh, questions. We also have a lot of comments. Uh, uh, let me pick one and, and come back on an argument that has uh, come in uh, several of your presentations or interventions. Uh, I, most of these have been focusing on the need, uh, I think this is agreed among all uh, speakers, for a const a context specific responses, uh, and you have had uh, uh, eloquent demonstrations of that. Uh, this uh, should be a major argument for going beyond national policies and to promote uh, territorial food systems in relevant bioregions. So basically, how do we uh, address this issue of the fact that uh, uh, we do need to have context specific response? What does it mean for national policies? And uh, uh, how do we and, and should we embrace uh, the idea that we hear more and more about uh, territorial approaches to food systems? I don't know if uh, one of you wants to answer. Uh, I see Ken, I see Mel, and if, if there are I, others. Can I jump in straight away? Because if, if there's one thing that I spend all of my time focused on, it's, it's this one about trying to, if you like, look at ways of tailoring different approaches to different localities. And I think for the topic of today about agronomy, this is absolutely essential. And I would argue that agronomy is absolutely a place-based science. It's all about tailoring. And when we talk about um, territorial or regional approaches, I mean, that's one level of complexity needed, but we have to recognize within any location, a wide diversity of farmers from those with very little resources to those with more resources, 
and different approaches will match to more to different farmers. So, you know, also including, if you like, the more commercial farmers that Mel is talking about, but then also looking at the food security or the nutrition security for the poorest. And I think this is why I, I, I feel so animated about these things, is that we shouldn't be closing the door on any one approach. We need to get away from this dogmatic, you know, this is the way we have to do it. And having our minds open, agronomists have to think broadly to look at all the tools that they have available and to help farmers make the right choices. It's not for us to tell them what to do. But that's why I would really argue against these rule-based uh, um, dogmatic approaches. But that's my, uh, that's my Thank you, Mele. I couldn't agree more. Uh, context really, really is very important. Uh, we have seen a lot of examples of Dutch greenhouse technology uh, being uh, being copy pasted to entirely different agroecological and societal and economic uh, situations. Uh, and um, uh, development cooperation has not enough uh, history in creating white elephants. Uh, and, and the natural ones that walk about in national parks, they're nice, but, uh, but the ones uh, that cost a lot of development funds, uh, they are a waste of, uh, of, of confidence, a waste of resources. Um, and that's why uh, I, I really agree with, uh, with what Ken says. If you get the agronomic basics uh, within a certain context right and build from there, uh, then even finding the market uh, need not be a, a big problem. Um, with uh, with uh, with uh, populations growing uh, uh, in in a uh, near a city like Cairo, the market very often is there. Uh, but if it's the smallholders that have to uh, meet market uh, requirements by themselves, then it's not going to work. Uh, so you have to get the right coalitions uh, 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 together uh, uh, to link farmers to markets and to link uh, the local agroecology uh, to uh, to what the market wants and needs. Uh, and we need research uh, for that as well. Uh, I, I love the fact that uh, Ken is, uh, is, is calling out uh, all the, uh, uh, all the uh, too good to be true stories. And as a uh, embassy representative, I come uh, across a lot of people who have found the silver bullet, uh, the technology that's going to uh, uh, transform the world. Uh, and very often I'm, I'm looking for uh, the good arguments to debunk that. Uh, but then uh, take that, uh, take people, uh, um, uh, give them uh, the benefit of, uh, of the doubt as well, and also look at, uh, look at what they can offer. Uh, in the chat, I also saw someone uh, saying, well, maybe Sikkim is not the lighthouse farm because it's very far uh, 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 remote from, from Egyptian society. Um, I do feel that they are not the answer, uh, but they have a lot to, uh, to, uh, to contribute uh, by, by giving inspiration and uh, by sharing some of the market access that, uh, that they have. Uh, so let's be critical to each other, to all partners, uh, but let's also give people the benefit of the doubt to create real action rather than just, just talk. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, any of the other colleagues would like to add on this. I think Jacques would like to respond and maybe we can have him before we yes. ask the next question. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to come back to two points. The first one, it has been emphasized in, in, in the discussion and in the chat, the importance of um, having a co-design process with, uh, with farmers, taking into account their diversity, whatever they are, small or bigger. <clears throat> so I think it's, it, it, of course it's important, but um, the limit I see is that in the same time, you need to have uh, um, a link with the, with the market. There are many cases where so agroecological solutions have been co-designed, but they lead, for example, to the uh, development of crops which have no, no big market uh, or with, for which the price is, is, is not reward, rewarding um, the cost of a farmer's practice. I mean, you have an example is the uh, case of food legumes. Food legumes in the MENA region is something which uh, has a potential to, to grow if you take, consider uh, the agroecological principle. But when you look at the market, it's, it's not so clear because uh, so unless you have a simultaneous co-design of the solution and um, in the context of the market, so with the, 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 um, the value chain actors, 
then you end up with solutions which are good on paper, but not um, practiced by farmers. And the second uh, aspect, uh, which also refer to a question what, that was raised by, the, by Rashid in the, uh, in, in the chat, is uh, if we agree that uh, we need to have a context specific response, um, then uh, it means also we have to be uh, clear but it means that in the project we develop, in the way we discuss with uh, investors and, and policy maker, um, the solution is not, I mean, it cannot be scaling solution. It, it is more scaling through capacity development, the, the co-design process across the diversity with community. Uh, so the scaling is not on the solution, it's more on the, the, on the approach and the enabling systems to, to have uh, um, local actors finding their solution. Um, and this becomes more difficult to argue, to present, to do cost benefit analysis. So I think we have to recognize also that there, there is a need of thinking differently uh, and having more um, argument to, to also show the benefit of uh, the scaling approach, which is more on the, on the way to solve the problem but on providing a solution. Thank you, yeah. Teresa. Um, thanks very much. We're trying to capture uh, questions that come from the region. And so I think there's one that is maybe pertaining to the circular economy. We haven't really talked so much. Um, can maybe the speakers um, uh, who are talking about the different approaches tell us a bit more about how we can reduce inputs and reduce waste, post-harvest waste, uh, with some of the, the, the techniques that you have, uh, have been familiar with. Um, I think this is not has been emphasized as much as, as um, production practices themselves. So if any commentary on reducing uh, inputs uh, and, and uh, post-harvest loss, losses and waste. Thank you. Anyone? We'll try to, I don't know if you can raise your hands, but I can try to see if you, okay, there is Mele. For, for us, uh, circular agri agriculture is very, very important. Um, and uh, uh, that, that, that's about a lot of things. It's about using crop, uh, crop residues and, uh, and animal manure uh, for, for composting. Uh, it's about uh, circular proteins for, uh, for, uh, for fish feed. Uh, recently, we had a study done on that. Uh, looking at opportunities to use uh, a poultry meal uh, uh, for for fish feed or insects uh, to be grown on uh, on uh, on organic waste uh, for for fish and poultry feed. Um, circular agriculture uh, is, uh, is 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 a, is a priority for our minister of agriculture, uh, and I'd like to refer people to to the vision uh, uh, that she published uh, on that uh, if they're interested uh, to to know more about that. Uh, thank you, Mele. I think I um, have have Jacques and then Ken. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, if I may, I want to come back to what you said. I mean, um, and uh, uh, Ken has explained this, I think, nicely. It's not necessarily about reducing input. There are situations where the initial state show uh, that, for example, when um, uh, because of the level of, of input used. I mean, if you take uh, cereal production in Egypt, it's clear the level of nitrogen fertilizer is very high. So you can start thinking of reducing, uh, but if you take over situation uh, in rain-fed uh, agriculture, it's probably in, um, in rain-fed cereals, for example, it may be increasing uh, uh, or using differently uh, the input. And the second thing is, is to avoid, I think, to put all input in the same, uh, in the same baskets because, um, uh, I mean, uh, fertilizer, uh, pesticides, energy, labor, water, uh, there are a lot of trade-offs. You can reduce one of them, uh, but then you increase the others. And uh, also depending on the context, um, the objective cannot be the same for, for reducing the water. For example, again, in the irrigated system in the Mediterranean region, 
there, uh, there is a possibility to reduce uh, water use by irrigation. This comes through a better management, better informed decision, because in most cases, uh, the use of water is, is, is a largely above the needs of the crops. But there are other places where um, um, uh, it can be through uh, increasing the use of water for irrigation on some crops uh, to favor, for example, uh, um, agroforestry systems or, or to favor some of the crops that have uh, more ecosystem services. So just to come back on these two notion of uh, not necessarily reducing, depending on the initial state, and also not considering all, all input together. Thank you. Good thanks I very am. much. Yep. Uh, yes, um, Ken, go ahead. I mean, thanks, Jacques, and great to know we're absolutely uh, in agreement on that. Rashid, Rashid Saraj had asked a question in the chat about using more novel biotech tools, and Francois Stepman also asked earlier about biotechnology and gene editing. And I'd just like to use the, the example that here in the Netherlands, I mean, they've, they've got a, a, a gene edited potato, which could be used, which is resistant to late blight, Phytophthora, where you can cut down the use of fungicides from 15 sprays a season to less than one or none. And, and I think that's agroecology, yeah? And this is my argument against dogma, if you like. That's a way of using biological variation to reduce chemical use. Why don't we do it? That's why I think I can use another example where people want to uh, make crops resistant to three herbicides so they can th spray three herbicides at once. And that's nonsense. Yeah. So dependent on the traits and how we use it, I would not rule out any approaches to biotechnology or whatever. And I think that fits within my concept of using the best of biology, the best of biological variation. Um, and what is then for me, absolutely agroecology. And that's, I think another argument, if you like, against this idea of, of having dogmatic approaches. Thank you, hey. Ken. Um, thanks for this variety of uh, uh, like um, opinions. I think we, in, in the sense of sort of breaking down the idea of what of inputs are not really putting them in the same basket. Um, and again, the kind of thing, the context specificness of it comes. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm always constantly thinking what kinds of assessments would be useful uh, if, if things had to be context specific and how high do you generalize something uh, in order for, you know, for, for FAO or seek uh, halves to be able to do the kind of work um, that would be effective and how high these levels of generalization can be in terms of assessments. Um, I'm going to turn, I think, to Jean-Marc. Yes, yeah. and uh, I, um, this is really uh, such an exciting conversation and there are still so many uh, exchanges on the chat. Unfortunately, we have already gone beyond our time and uh, we do need to uh, bring this to a close. Uh, I think uh, uh, we were asked uh, as the moderators to to do a, a, a wrap up. I, I think this is absolutely an impossible task, and I, I will uh, want to see uh, what my colleague Teresa will do because uh, the discussion was uh, so rich, and uh, definitely there are still so many questions that I would have liked to, to ask to to the panelists. Uh, we will have to dig deep into these questions uh, and uh, maybe help uh, shaping our, our future Zoominars uh, around some of these that are really important. So let me not summarize. Uh, let me say that uh, I was glad to uh, hear uh, this uh, very clear dichotomy between on one side the practice Uh, follow for a more sustainable uh, agriculture. Uh, one word that uh, I think it appeared in the uh, chat uh, among uh, uh, by one of the participants uh, expressed in a way slightly different from what I would say. I didn't hear about uh, the incentives, the incentives that farmers needed to get 
to move uh, towards uh, different practices. Uh, and these incentives is not, doesn't mean uh, uh, subsidies or it doesn't necessarily mean subsidies. It means uh, better knowledge. It means better access to markets. It means probably a lot of these enabling conditions we have been talking about, but clearly there are a series of conditions that need to be met for uh, uh, things to change on the ground. And our farmers, whether they are small, medium or large, they will all uh, need to see a signal uh, so that uh, they can uh, move towards uh, more sustainable uh, practices. Uh, I will, I think I'll stop it here because uh, um, as I said, I think we, it's, it's impossible to, to go more into uh, to, to summarize what you have said without, uh, without uh, destroying all the, the happy and the, the very uh, uh, lively discussion. So let me uh, just uh, thank everybody again, including uh, obviously our panelists, our speakers, and, and also our participants who, who were with us uh, all along this uh, uh, Zoominar. And let me give the floor to uh, my colleague, Teresa, for the last words. Well, thanks, Jean-Marc. I thought you had the last word, but since you have uh, identified oh, the word of the day for you, mine would be resilience of farmers. Um, a lot of the comments that came out, they were not so much questions, but pointing out that farmers are ex extremely resilient themselves. And this the, the challenge is for us how to capture that, the intimate knowledge of context uh, in our participatory platforms and the, the ways we do our work. Um, and that's the challenge to all of us to capture that resilience and and to ensure that that is channeled into sustainable practices um, that make sense for, for farmers. So that's my, that's my takeaway. Thank you. So I guess this is where we close. Thank <laughs> you very much. I wonder whether we give the floor back to Rashid to, uh, to close or announce the next one or whatever. No, I think it's all done. Thanks again uh, to all of you, uh, brilliant. And we look forward to see you uh, on 3rd of June. So this will be a new topic. And uh, so we uh, will come you again uh, for the next seminar series. Thanks a lot. And thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.